Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Kevin Lee. Kevin Lee is the co-founder and CEO of Did It and We Care. And just to tell you a little bit about uh, Did It first, it's been acknowledged as, or Kevin in general has been acknowledged as a search engine marketing expert since 1995. Did It's unparalleled results of client growth have earned Did It recognition not only among marketers, but as part of the 2007 Inc. 500. Uh, number 137, as well as number 12 position on Deloitte's Fast 500. And We Care have done some amazing things. You know, basically, Kevin, tell them a little bit about We Care and what it does. Uh, we Care takes the value of people's everyday online behaviors and monetizes it to their chosen nonprofit cause. So it's generated about five and a half million dollars so far for a variety of nonprofits, including the ASPCA, Save the Children, and about 700 others. Yeah, that's amazing. And Kevin has been recognized as the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2008 finalist in Metro New York area, which is an amazing feat in itself. And I was especially excited to hear what lessons you have to teach us because Kevin's going to tell us some of his top advice for business owners and founders, the big, some of the big lessons he learned from challenges, roadblocks, and mistakes he made along the way. And I always like to include one fun fact. And one fun fact about Kevin is that he's addicted to water views. So wherever he is, he likes to have out his window uh, water. So in his home or if he's vacationing, because it's calming to him. Absolutely. Um, so... First, Kevin, tell us what's an example, you know, you've built a lot of successful companies. What's an example of a big mistake you made? And I, I get a lot of questions, people, it's hard to pick the right partner. Was there a mistake you made with that? Yeah, um, you know, an earlier uh, business that I co-founded uh, before Did It, which Did It was to some extent the, a bit of a spinoff of, um, you know, uh, it's not so much that it was the wrong partner, but there was a no, I think there was a little bit of misplaced trust there. Um, and so, you know, often you get so tied up in sort of running the business, growing the business, doing the day to day that, um, you know, you don't you don't uh, necessarily always look at the books as carefully as you should and 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 make sure that everything's on track in every facet of the business. Yeah. How do you handle something like that? I mean, that's tough because. You know, we hear about we know kind of in relationships what we do, but in the business, it, it's a little trickier, too. It is absolutely tricky. Luckily, uh, you know, businesses sometimes reach the the size where they have a controller, right, who's you know managing all the finances. And at that point, you know, to some extent, they're an independent, you know, third party separate from the from the founders. And I think that that's really valuable. And um, I, I wouldn't have thought that that was an important role, but I certainly put a lot more credence in that. Um, you know, after having, uh, you know, reached the size where, con you know, c controllers are involved, or if not, maybe just your, uh, your accountant, um, and having all, all business partners sort of in, in regular discussions with the accountant if there's no uh, controller. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, partnerships are, I think, a little bit challenging. You know, my wife calls my business partner the other wife, you right. know, because he and I have been together as business partners for 17 years. We finish each, finish each other's sentences. We know what each other are thinking. We have our occasional arguments, you know, just for the purposes of hashing things out. And so, uh, picking the right partner, I think, is is really key. And and it's definitely valuable to go into business with a partner because you do get that sort of yin yang balance. Now, how we fight is important too. Can you give us an example how uh, you and your partner, obviously, for 17 years, kind of hash things out in like a productive way it, it's sort of like a debate you know uh in, and and sometimes it'll end up you know looking like more of the de a debate that might occur on you know early versions of saturday night live but you know he won't actually say jane you know or whatever if you remember that quote but you know the we really just go back and forth and try to hash through the reasons why each of us have taken a particular position and then we, we, we sometimes end up with a compromise or we sometimes end up sort of acquiescing that the other person had a much stronger point. But, you know, we respect each other's viewpoints uh, sufficiently to really hear the other person through. I think that's key. Yeah. So another roadblock that people run up against that I always hear about is when they're bootstrapping company, do they bring in outside money? Have you had any big challenges or, you know, mistakes with that? 
Yeah, I think uh, the mistake we had was really just getting distracted by that during a certain phase of, of our growth where we sort of thought, hey, uh, you know, we have one angel investor who's articulated that they might want to exit or they're looking to exit. Um, and if we could replace that non-strategic investor with a strategic investor, that would facilitate the company's growth and health and et cetera. And um, the mistake we made was was not getting a definitive agreement in place from that that investor because you know in, in the last minute you know after uh, tens of thousands of dollars had been spent on due diligence uh, on both sides really I don't you know uh, it just sort of the deal fell apart because the person just changed their mind right and even though they had said that they were going to pull the trigger they didn't pull the trigger in the end so um, it could be very distracting to go through that whole due diligence process and to go through the process of sort of interviewing the right organization and or individual to invest. And I think you just have to be really careful that you don't take your eye off of the ball. What would you have done differently or what would you do differently in the future? I think uh, I would try to just lock down the terms of something before you go through the, the effort and energy. Because mm -hmm. um, even just sort of asking around, uh, hey, do, you know, who would, who might be a potential investor that that can be really time consuming and, and now that I do angel investing um, you know I see it from the other side too I see people coming to me and uh, you know having conversations with other angels as well and uh, it's not always clear that that they should even be talking to me <laughs> so yet they're talking to me yeah so what's a piece of advice you give to those angel investors that come to you um, you know, know what they're looking for from an angel investor above and beyond the money, mm -hmm. because I think the the hu one of the huge differences between uh, you know venture money and um, angel money is in the case of angel money, you, you're getting the help of an individual, right? Potentially above and beyond the money, because obviously that that angel has a has a vested interest in the success of your venture. So to the extent that you can tap their Rolodex or their expertise or whatever the case may be, you know, think that through before you even have the conversation with them because um, the value that they bring above and beyond the cash may be much more important than the cash. Yeah, yeah, that's true. What's, and a lot of people struggle with this, is they, we hear this adage about being the best at something. Like if your company, you want to be the best out there. Don't focus on other things, but then other things come up in the business. So you start focusing on other things. Have you had any challenges with that with your business? Uh, I have, uh, particularly with Did It. Um, you know, we we've I think continue to be the the best, if not one of the very best, in paid search um, campaign management, and we're very good at organic SEO as well. But despite clients ha asking us, "Hey, can you manage our?" paid media social or earned media social uh, for, for the longest time we sort of said no we're a search boutique we, we do search engine marketing and you know it, it sort of took a couple of client defections where they went to one-stop shops uh, just to get that you know ease of the client agency relationship where that sort of was the wake-up call and I you know had I sort of been paying closer attention to the trends in the industry, I think I probably would have made that transition a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. and maybe I could have retained some of those clients who, who told me afterwards, listen, I recognize that a digital agency is not going to be the best at everything, but as long as they're pretty good in those other things, as long as what I want them for most, they're the best at, that's good enough. What got you over that hump of transitioning to that? Because that's a hard thing. You know, you've been doing this for, you were doing that for a long time. You're an expert at that. Was there a conversation with a customer or a partner that kind of got you over that hump to, to bring in those other services? It was really when we did sort of, uh, after a couple of client losses that happened really close to each other where they went to one-stop shops. Uh, my business partner and I and the executive team really went on to sort of, you know, do a, 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 a autopsy of the relationship like you know what didn't work you know we were you know hitting home runs in paid search and doing really well for what we were what our role was yet they left right so and then chatting with them afterwards where they where it was clear that someone went 
very senior within the organization said, you know, we want the one-stop shopping. That was really the uh, the catalyst. But we couldn't do anything about it immediately because I also had this problem. Like, I can't get into these other business lines and hire the staff until I have either existing clients, new clients who are ready to sign contracts. So I had a catch-22. The chicken and the egg, yeah. Exactly. What do you do? So the, the, the solution to that was, was M&A, mergers and acquisitions, right? So we acquired uh, first a digital agency that had a broader service offering than we did, including some overlap with us. And then, you know, we can, we're sort of on this, this same theme. We acquired a, an agency that was sort of 60% traditional advertising that had, you know, much less overlap with us just so that we could now sort of offer this one-stop shopping. Um, and we're a pretty small agency on a relative basis to have one-stop shopping because usually you think about these large agency holding companies have one-stop shopping. But when we looked at the numbers and we thought like, well, what are, what are those clients who are leaving for a one-stop shop actually getting? Well, they're still only getting a three or four person team within each discipline. And as long as we have sort of a six to eight person team in each discipline, that's good enough, right? And yeah. so that's what we did. So, you know, transitioning from some of the challenges and mistakes, what's uh, some milestone? What's a mi- big milestone you're especially proud of after you overcame some of those things and maybe one in We Care and one in, in Did It? Um, in We Care, the, the, the real huge milestone was turning cash flow positive. You know, after having invested uh, a, a lot of millions of dollars essentially in, in getting We Care to that point, realizing that on a month-to-month basis it was now going to be able to fund itself um, that was that was really key so um, that, that was a we care milestone um, now on the did it side uh, you know the, the, the we it, it's really been we've had different milestones and as we pivoted the company in different directions and so every time we sort of feel like we know where the future is and where you know We've repositioned the company for where the future is going to be. That right. that's been critical for us. Yeah. Um, what's one of the best pieces of advice that you'd want to make sure a business owner knows? Um, you know, I think um, bo- both being smart with who you take money from and being smart with who you partner with. Um, you know, uh, a business partnership is at least as difficult to dissolve as a marriage, perhaps more so in some ways. Uh, and so you have to be very careful about who you end up picking as your business partners and that there's both uh, a, a, a good fit, you know, that the, the two of you balance off each other in sort of a yin-yang kind of way, but also that you feel like there's the proper level of trust uh, between the parties. Right. And I know there's a big, you know, people debate in their head sometimes that they're thinking about getting their MBA as opposed to starting their business and they get a lot out of their business. And I know you you did your MBA at Yale. What did you learn from the MBA early on before you, you started your businesses? Well, I actually had one business that predated Yale that I started as an undergraduate uh, called Deliveries Unlimited, which was a food delivery service to the campus. But uh, one thing, you know, even having sort of been the small entrepreneur before uh, going into the MBA program, I think the MBA program really, uh, if it's a good one, you know, really has you understand the, the, the financials uh, of, of business and understand how to prioritize things within business. You know, one thing that, you know, an economics professor um, as well as a decision-making professor really sort of beat into me was this idea that of thinking on the margin, right? So what is the potential return that you get from anything that you do uh, with your time? With your money, with your with your marketing dollars, I mean that's one thing we use really heavily. It did it is this idea of understanding the marginal impact of every dollar and where it goes. Should it be another click bought from Facebook? Should it be another click bought from you know one keyword or another keyword or Google or Bing or this time of day or that geography? And really understanding the relative marginal value that everything that you do brings to the company. So Kevin, I have one last question for you. Before I ask it, I, I know you talked a little bit about We Care uh, in the beginning. Could you tell us a little bit more about Did It and what you're working on now? What's exciting to you? Um, you know, in addition to uh, uh, you know just 
transforming the digital agency side into the one-stop shopping, we're still working on some really cool technology. So one thing that we saw a lot of potential in about two years ago was this idea of using geography as a proxy for audience in search engine marketing. So if you've ever used the Google AdWords account or, or Bing Ad Center account, you get to pick geographies. And in the beginning, the, the level to which of accuracy to which Google knew where you were or Microsoft knew where you were, it used to be really fuzzy. And so they didn't know to a, a great level of specificity. But as their targeting resolution got tighter and tighter, we really started thinking about, hey, the one part that's usually ignored in search marketing is audience. And within traditional media, audience is critically important. So we started to run experiments and see, hey, can we use geography as a way to separate out, you know, the rich people on the Upper East Side from the not-so-rich people in East Harlem or the rich people in Beverly Hills from the not-so-rich people in West Hollywood. And to the extent that we can geo-target within campaigns at a pretty granular level, mm -hmm. it would allow our clients to afford higher bids in the auctions for keywords against those specific geographies. So we built an entire technology called Maps that that takes a master campaign and clones it out into all these separate geographies or and now uses the enhanced campaigns, which is something new that Google just rolled out, to do that. And it's really allowed us to, to cherry pick out those individuals who are a really good fit for, you know, uh, a more expensive product or, um, you know, uh, the, where the conversion rate would be higher. Yeah, and I think actually if you haven't checked out, if the audience hasn't checked this out, you have to check out their YouTube channel because you guys have the best commercials for this. You know what I'm talking about? You have <laughs> the guy with the luggage and they're hilarious. Is this yeah. exactly what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So that people have to go on YouTube and what's the what's your, you, do you know what the YouTube um, channel is called? Is it called I, Did It? Uh, it, I, it probably is. I actually don't know our YouTube channel. Okay. Either my head okay well anyways your website is didit.com right that's right okay so check it out and go to their youtube and watch one of those there's like a couple commercials i watched them all they're they're hilarious and they're like right on the money they're really funny um the last question i had for you kevin was you're the sem guru what search what was search like in 95 when you got started <laughs> um well certainly seo was very easy then um you know, because you could make a change on a website and uh, know within 24 hours whether your SEO was successful or not. And if it wasn't, you could go ahead and make another change and you would know whether it was successful or not. And there were no industry guidelines with regards to what was black hat and what was a white hat. And so you could do things to sort of manipulate uh, the results in your favor and there sort of was nobody to tell you, well, that's not okay. So uh, it was really the Wild West in the beginning of the days of SEO. I think it's become uh, much more of a, of a sort of standardized industry. I mean, to the point where Google and Webmaster actually have, uh, Google and Bing both have a Webmaster Tools area where they actually give you uh, SEO advice within the confines of, hey, this is, these are some things you're doing wrong. Whereas in the early days, you know, there was sort of, an arcane knowledge that a few people had where they could sort of do things to manipulate the results. It's, it's, it's much more something that needs to become a business process within an organization now. What should someone know about SEM now? Uh, well, you know, within SEM, uh, thinking on the margin, that's paid search. People usually use SEM as, as paid search and SEO as uh, search engine optimization. Now, knowing the marginal value of every click before you buy it is really, really valuable. So to the extent you can do that on your own, use a technology as a standalone or, or use an agency that, that shares that kind of philosophy, that's really important, yeah. including understanding the interaction effect between other media and search. Because people do not sit bolt upright at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, Caribbean cruise vacation, I need to take a Caribbean cruise <laughs> vacation. Something stimulates that, that search behavior Often it's either your own marketing, somebody else's marketing, some PR event, etc. And so to the extent that you can understand that, uh, that can make your, your search campaign much more powerful. And with organic SEO, uh, it's really content is king. Uh, and it always has been in the SEO business. It's just really weird that now content marketing is suddenly in vogue 
whereas those of us doing SEO for 16, 17, 18 years have been like, okay, finally, you guys get it. That's great. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank Everyone you. should check out those YouTube videos and uh, We Care and, and Did It. So thanks so much, Kevin. Thank you. Take care.